Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld, and I'd like to welcome you to Back to the Bible Canada. I'm glad to have you join me. I'm doing a, a series on the book of Proverbs, just a couple of select passages. If you do have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open it uh, to Proverbs chapter two. There's some great stuff that, that we're gonna take a look at. And I'm gonna say that transformation for all of us happens from the inside out. Gonna say more about that, but Proverbs two is gonna speak about that very issue. Everybody, everybody wants to be happy. I mean, who in the world says, I'm planning to be as miserable as I can be? Who gets married with the hope, you know, that within five years I'm gonna get a divorce? Or who gets married with the hope that I'm gonna spend the rest of my life bickering and complaining at each other with this one person? I mean, nobody anticipates that being their future, but it does happen to some people. And that's what I do wanna talk about. How do you? build life from the inside out. Um, so uh, once in a while, you know, you pick up self-help books and th there are a lot of financial self-help books and they'll talk about, you know, how if you're in your mid-20s, for instance, if you plan things rightly, by the time you're, you know, whatever age they give you, um, you're gonna be able to retire uh, with more than enough. And here's the plan and how to do that. Well, that might all be fine and well. You know, a plan on the outside looks easy to follow, but the years begin to tick by. And if you don't know how to say no to your, what I like to call your wanter, you know, uh, all the things in life that you just want and the things that you spend money on um, and the things that you, you know, you blow money out the back door. And, you know, if, if you don't know how to say no to some of that, uh, all of the other things that you read in a how-to self-help book isn't going to work. The transformation has to begin first within us before there's any effectiveness on the outside. And that's what we're gonna to get to when we come to Proverbs chapter two. Um, I, I've, got an, uh, I, I've got a background that I wanna do on this chapter. And so if you do have a Bible with you, I want you to pay attention to it. And I'm gonna lead you through these uh, 22 verses that make up uh, Proverbs chapter two. There are 22 verses here. And in the original Hebrew, it's all one sentence. So it's a very long sentence, no periods all the way through. Uh, it runs, feels like one sentence. But it's also poetry, and the poetry can actually be divided into two sections, verses one to 11, and then verse 12 to 22. So 11 verses, then 11 verses. Um, what's also fascinating is because there are 22 verses in Hebrew and in Proverbs chapter two, uh, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So in a sense, in this introduction to wisdom, this is the, the A to Z about how wisdom is to be obtained. How do you become an individual who embarks on a lifetime of wisdom that transforms you from the inside to the outside? So that's what this intend is, is intended to do. The first 11 verses, and, and I want you to notice something. So if you got your Bible out, I want you to notice that the 11 verses go in a series of four, then another series of four, then a series of three verses. And then the second half, that is the last 11 verses, works that way as well, four, four, three. So let me show you the first 11 verses, and I want you to watch it. It says, my son, if, did you notice the if there? So you have an if. And then if you go on to verse Three, yes, if, so there's your second if. And then look at verse four, it starts with the word if. So if, if, and if. And then when you get to verse five, then, you see that? Um, and then if you, if you go all the way to a verse nine, you get the second then. So if, 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 then, then. So this is a, an extended if, then. If, if this is true of you, then you can expect these results. So that's how that actually works. And then the last, 11 verses, that is from verses 12 to 22, uh, there's something interesting there. So if you listen to the message of wisdom, if you actually qualify, uh, there are three examples that verses 12 to 22 give you in terms of how wisdom is going to make a difference in some very practical matters of life. So let's get back to the beginning of chapter two. It begins with the words, my son. So this is the scenario. Uh, you have a wise father who is teaching an inexperienced son. He wants, the father is wise, the father is godly, the father looks to the Lord, the father wants his son to grow up 
to be joyful. He wants the son to grow up to be wise in his dealings with things. And so he's giving some instructions. And that's how we are to understand this. So my son, if. So we're going to look at the three if statements at the beginning. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. So we'll stop there because that's the first if. My son, if you receive my words. Now the word receive simply means to welcome something with joy. So the father is saying to his son, son, I wanna teach you wisdom, but there are a couple of ifs that you need to come to terms with before we get to the actual lessons about wisdom. You see, transformation happens from the inside out and there has to be a transformation on the inside of you. And the transformation has to be that you receive my words. That is, when I tell you about wisdom, you need to welcome what I say with a great deal of joy. That's what's implied in the word to receive. If you welcome my words with joy. So we might say, if we're to apply this to ourselves, uh, wisdom begins with this primary if statement. You, you've got to welcome wisdom with a great deal of joy. And if you treasure up my commands within you. I, I like that word that says to treasure up. You see, commitment is required, um, and, uh, and the commitment means, of course, that you welcome the words and you treasure the words. Um, I don't know whether or not you remember this, but I, I think almost everybody that I've ever spoken to has the exact same experience. Do you remember when you were a kid and you first learned to ride a bicycle? You know, somebody was holding on from behind, maybe it was your mom or dad, or maybe it was an older brother or sister or somebody uh, was running behind you and saying, don't worry about it, I'm gonna hold on to the bike, you just sit on the seat and you pedal. And then at some point in time, you came to realize that the person that was holding your bike wasn't holding it anymore, you were doing it on your own. I mean, you remember that? Yeah, I think we all do. Now, how did you respond at that point in time? Did you say, uh, this is so great I can do it, or did you freak out and did you fall down? You see, uh, it, it depends on who you were, but I don't know anybody um, who ever learned how to ride a bicycle that didn't, as in consequence of learning how to ride a bicycle, get some you know, scraped knees and scraped elbows and whatever else bruises they had on their body because there was a certain degree of commitment that was required before that skill would be learned. Well, in a sense, that's exactly what the first if here is all about. My son, if you welcome my words with joy and if you treasure them, that is, you esteem them highly. I mean, the old rabbis, when it talked about treasuring something, uh, they would say something like this. They would say, in order to learn a lesson, uh, you have to learn it a hundred times and you have to go over the same lesson a hundred times because unless you do it and then, you know, you're going to have to memorize parts of it, perhaps all of it, but as you continue to review and you see it as something that's very valuable, that's worth the time commitment that's put into it, if you don't do that, you're not going to learn. So that's what the Father is saying. If you welcome my words with joy and if you treasure uh, my commands within you, and then he says, making your ear attentive. See, it, it's as if you form a habit with your ear that the minute you begin to listen to words of wisdom, the ear tilts in one direction. You see what I'm saying? And immediately you've trained yourself to begin to listen. My wife, who's taught piano on occasion and is a good pianist, um, she will often say that in order to learn how to play the piano, her words, you have to develop ruts in your brain, she said. That is, your eye will see a musical score, your hands are on the keys, you know exactly where they are to go, and your eyes and your hands are in coordination with each other. You have understanding of what you're reading and you know what action your hands are to take and your ear is listening to the sounds that you're making so that you can make any adjustments that are necessary when the sounds are not as they're supposed to be. But as you continue to repeat the lesson over and over and over again, your brain begins to form ruts or natural patterns or just there, there's just a away from your eyes, the musical score to your eyes, to your hands, that just naturally takes place. It's kind of like a, a brain muscle memory. It just keeps on going over and over again. And that's the first if here. If you develop 
a commitment to something so that you're inclining your heart to understanding. See, that's the first thing that's required. So, you know, a father wants to say to his son, I want to teach you wisdom, but I know that I can't get to first base until you, my son, commit yourself to saying, I am going to develop a heart attitude towards wisdom that finds it a treasure. It's something that I want. So, so the father says, look, in order to get wisdom, you have to be committed to it. And now comes the second if, and that's the one that we find in verse three. Yes, if you call out for insight, if you raise your voice for understanding. So if you go all the way to Proverbs chapter eight, uh, you're gonna find um, there's a different, exactly the opposite is being said. In, in chapter eight, verse one, does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? So there's a picture of Lady Wisdom walking through the streets and she's calling out, anybody who wants me, come to me. See, that's what Lady Wisdom is doing in chapter eight. But here in chapter two, uh, the young unexperienced uh, lad is supposed to call out himself. Uh, In other words, he is supposed to um, raise his voice and say, Wisdom, where are you? I want you. So the, the second if has something to do with, you've got to take initiative. Um, I, I know this, um, that you know, when I went to university, um, that you know, it's one thing to attend the classes and find them fascinating and to develop an ear for them so that you want them, but there's something else that has to happen. You have to call out for more, and that means you're gonna head out to the library and you're gonna spend some time there with some books and expand your worldview. It means you're calling out for more. In other words, you're not satisfied with just hearing on one occasion. You're looking to broaden your base. So if you um, commit yourself to wisdom and if you also call out for more of it, and then thirdly, if you seek it like silver, see, and search for it like hidden treasures. You know, I, I like that as well because um, this, this means that, you know, wisdom has something to do with how important it is in your life. Uh, you don't have to look around to find all sorts of people that will expend untold effort to get ever more rich. Um, I've known people who have uh, taken time away from their family and allowed their marriage and the relationship with their kids to go to ruins because they're looking to get ahead in the company or in their business and they're looking to make ever more money and they're willing to sacrifice everything else in order to gain money. The world's full of those kind of people. They think it's a treasure. So here's what the father is saying to his son. You know, you've got to seek for wisdom like people seek for silver. You've got to do that. Um, it's it kind of like this. Let me use my, my schooling illustration as well. Uh, you know, when it comes time to study, um, you know, there will be all sorts of people who say, hey, let's, let's hang out at the beach. And you're going to say, well, actually, I'm going to hang out in the library because I recognize this is far more important to me than the other. So, so that's what the three ifs are. If you're committed to this thing, if you're calling out to it, uh, seeking to expand your base, and if you see it as, as valuable as the thing is, if that's true of you, my son, says the father, then, look at verse five, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Now, it's very important here to say, oh, I thought it was gonna say something else. But that's what the father says. The thing that's gonna happen to you is you're going to understand how great and grand God is. Now, please don't misunderstand what's being said here. It's not as if uh, Proverbs is teaching that here's the steps to get to know God. You've gotta think wisdom is important. You've gotta commit yourself enough to it. And then in the end, you'll get right with God. That's, That's not what Proverbs is saying and that's not what the whole Bible is saying. The Bible always tells us that in order to be right with God, God has to take the initiative. We never take the initiative. God so loved the world that he gave his son. And what we do is simply respond to what God has done for us. So Proverbs is not teaching us that, you know, if you make wisdom a course of study that you are committed to for a lifetime, well, you're going to get to know God. No, it's not saying that because let's continue to read. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Look at verse six, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in integrity. In other words, God protects those who are his. And 
This is a word that's given to the covenant people of God. See, if you find yourself seeking for wisdom, it's because God in his graciousness has opened up his storehouse of wisdom and he's offering it to you. See, that's what Proverbs is really teaching. The initiative was never with us. The initiative was always with God. But when you find yourself seeking for wisdom, then you're going to discover something. All the effort that I've put into wisdom has actually come as a gracious gift from God. I mean, what is it in my own heart that made wisdom so important? And the writer of Proverbs answers, look, I'll tell you what it is. It's God himself who's created that desire in your heart. Once you come to that understanding, you're going to know something about the fear of God. You're going to reverence God. You're going to find God overwhelmingly satisfying because God has been doing this in your life. That's the great discovery of everyone who's seeking for wisdom. They've discovered it was God that was there the whole time that gave me the appetite that I have. (laughs) So that's the first then. You remember I said, if, 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 then, here's the second then, and you're going to find that uh, in verse 9. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. Now, in the past, in chapter 1, if you were with me when we introduced Proverbs, I said that in chapter 1, there are these words are already found. Righteousness has to do with moral dealings. Uh, Justice has to do with the fact that, that we don't take advantage of someone else. And equity means that in the end of our dealings with somebody else, that there is, an, there is an equitable arrangement that we find a way that both of us are positively affected by our transactions. In other words, we're not looking to take advantage of people. So here's what Proverbs promises. If you make wisdom a course of study and you're committed to it and you want to expand that base, then know this, this will happen to you. You're going to find that righteousness, justice, and equity, every good path for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. You see, in other words, you've created a taste for wisdom. I'd like to give an example, and and, and I don't know, maybe you'll you'll think this is a silly example, but, you know, I've I've spent a great deal of time um, when I was a pastor uh, with a, a number of Korean people who introduced me to Korean food. And I found out that kimchi, if you know what that is, uh, there, is a, a, there is a milder form of kimchi and there is a super hot form of kimchi. And I understand it has to do with where exactly you live on the Korean peninsula, where you've trained your palate. Now, because I have a, a mild palate, the first time I was introduced to what's called red kimchi, um, I, you know, my eyes were spinning around in my head like a slot machine and fire was coming out of my mouth and my ears. I don't have a palate that, that actually agrees with things that are too spicy. I, I just don't go there. And even though I'm sure it tasted fantastic, I couldn't get beyond the fact that my mouth was on fire. You see, I didn't have, I hadn't had a trained palate that would appreciate that kind of food. Well, that's... That's an example of what wisdom is all about. Wisdom comes in this way. When a person from youth onward, but we can get to do this older as well, when we begin to train our palate so that the minute we hear wisdom, that we incline our ear. It's like we, we, we edge ourselves forward and we say, oh, there's a, a lesson on wisdom to learn here. So, so I want to get a little bit more of that. So when the wisdom will then come into your heart and wisdom is going to be pleasant to your soul. In fact, verse 11 says discretion, which can also mean shrewdness or exceptional insight, will watch over you. Understanding is going to guard you. It's going to form some kind of a shield to you. So notice it watches over you and it guards you at the same time. There are a lot of people who have no wisdom. And because of the poor life choices that they constantly make, they have very little skill in living. They're guided by impulses or gut reactions or by prejudices or by what the culture teaches them is true. They, they've never been able to function in the arena of God's wisdom. And because of that, find themselves in trouble over and over again. And they'll cry out to God and say, God, get me out of this mess. God is gracious. Sometimes he actually does that. 
and other times he allows us to wallow allows us to wallow in our own misery until we finally come to terms with the fact that it's my unwise decisions that continue to lead me into these messy relationships that I have over and over again. But but here's a promise. See, if if wisdom becomes pleasant to you, your your palate has been directed towards wisdom. You like it. You're ready to eat it whenever it comes along. It's going to watch over you. It's going to guard you. So it will make sure that the decisions in life that you're required to make, that you're not going to make bad ones, you're going to make good ones. So uh, that's the, the first 11 verses. It's, it's laying the groundwork in which a wise father is spending time with his son. And he's saying, son, I want to teach you to really get a commitment, a lifelong commitment, that skill in living, making decisions in life that will lead to the best possible outcomes will be your lot in life. And then, as I've said, the last 11 verses from verse 12 through to verse 22, uh, the wise father then gives three examples. He's he's been talking about the concept, the theory. He wants his son to always have a commitment to wisdom. But then the beauty of this whole thing is, uh, let me look at the first of the examples, verses 12 to 15. Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked, who are devious in their ways. Now you can get the the idea here. The father knows that as his son grows, as he gets older, uh, as the years go by, his voice of influence in his son's life is going to be diminished. And the voices of friends and colleagues and all manner of acquaintances, those voices will get louder and louder. Um, I have a memory of that in my own family. My, my oldest daughter is Rachel, and I, I still remember, I, I'm not quite sure I remember her age. I'm going to say she was around 11 years old, maybe 10, 11, maybe 12, but I think she was younger than that. But uh, there came a time when I watched her open her door. You know, back in those days, we had cassette tapes, and she had all these kids' cassette tapes with kids' songs and you know, all sorts of kids' stories and everything else. And she had put them all in one package and she had put them in a box and she took them outside of her door and she said, I won't be needing these anymore. And she left them outside of her door. They were to be for her brother and sister. And then she walked back into her room and she closed the door. And when she did that, I was watching her. And I had a deep feeling I knew exactly what was going on. As that door closed, it seemed to me that she was closing the door on her childhood. And and indeed, that's exactly what happened. There was a next point in her life. It was going to be exciting for her, uh, but she was moving to the next place that God has designated. Wise parents know that their children go through transitional times. And this wise father also knows that the time has now come when the voices of friends become ever more influential. They become louder, if you will. They have a greater draw. When the son was younger, the father and the mother's voice was the loudest voice that child heard, but that's no longer the case. But here's what the father does know. He does know that when wisdom comes, it just has become the, you know, the the impulse of the soul. He also knows something happens in this son. He says, it will deliver you from the way of evil and from men of perverted speech. Now, perverted speech has something to do with with what follows after that. It says, who forsake the paths of uprightness. Now, slow down here and notice what these young men are doing. They forsake the path of uprightness. That is, it must mean that at one point in time, they were on the path of uprightness, uh, but now they have decided to abandon it. Um, So you have to assume that, uh, you know, the, the son of this father is not running into people you know, who were, you know, running in gangs all of their lives. Rather, these are the young men that he grew up with. And some of the young men that he's grown up with have abandoned the way of wisdom and they have gone their their own paths. And the father knows that at some point in time, there will be young men like that. And those young men will make an appeal to his son and their voices will seem loud to him. These individuals are saying, look, forget the way of wisdom, walk in the way of folly. 
follow us. In fact, it goes on to say, they walk in the ways of darkness. And here it's speaking about moral darkness. They rejoice in doing evil and they delight in perverseness of evil. See, their paths are crooked. So he knows this drawing power is going to be there and he's warning his son before it happens. He's saying, look son, the days will come when it's not gonna be half as exciting to listen to me anymore. And you're gonna have friends who are going to make a great impact in your life. But if you learn wisdom now, you'll know who to attach yourself to. You'll know which friends to enjoy and which ones to stay away from. You know, wise parents always wanna make sure that you know their kids are connected uh, with other kids and other influences outside of the family who will make a positive influence in their lives. I mean, that's why I always say to parents, you know, you got kids, I mean, get them involved in a youth group. Don't be so foolish to say, you know, youth group, you know, it comes and goes and, you know, my kid could be involved in violin lessons or soccer practice or whatever else there are. And I'll abandon those very important connections among God's people. If you do that, then notice this, that the voices that will speak to your child's life, that ones that will become loudest will not be the voices of faith. So the wise parent knows and he wants to stack the deck in his or her favor. That's what's being said here. So that's the first thing. Um, you're, going to, you're not going to be flattered by individuals who call you to be unfaithful because you've developed a taste for wisdom. So that's, that's the first example. Here's the second one, and it's found in verses 16 to 19. It says, so you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So here's the second thing that the father knows about his son. Um, you have to imagine that the son is not the son who's rebellious. Uh, the son is the one who's interested in the ways of God. He, he's, he's got a keen appetite, but the father also knows that there will be awakening of his son's sexuality. You know, maybe you get a son who, you know, at the age of 15 or so buys one of these, you know, faithfulness rings and says, you know, I'm gonna be true to Christ. And, you know, when I get married, I'm gonna get married to a, a, you know, a virgin just like me. Um, and so that's what the father and the mother who's godly dreams about. But the father also recognizes that somewhere along the path, his son is going to come in contact with a woman that's unlike any other woman that his son has ever encountered. You know, this woman, he says, first of all, it says she, has, she is a forbidden woman. In other words, God has forbidden interaction with her. Um, and he also says she's got smooth words. In other words, the words that she speaks to his son are gonna be words that the son's never heard before. I mean, she's gonna tell the son how, you know, you know, how buff he is. She's gonna tell him, you know, what, what kind of a man, he, she's gonna tell him all the words that his soul desperately wants to hear. And with those words of flattery, she's gonna entice him and he's gonna follow her. And, and furthermore, this woman, who in this case is an older woman, she for, forsakes the companion of her youth. That is, she's already committed adultery on her own husband, and she's saying to this young man, you know, sexual purity, don't worry about that, because I'm gonna offer you a series of delights that those other faithful gals will never be able to offer. I know tricks that they don't know. I know pleasures they've never heard about, and you can have them with me. And, and, and here's, what, here's what the father wants his son to know. Verse 18 says, her house sinks down to death. See, I, I don't know whether you know this, but the Hawaiian Islands are slowly moving north. I, I, I at one time knew exactly how much they move north every year, but there's a slow progression in which the Hawaiian Islands will eventually end up in Alaska. Uh, thankfully, it's not gonna happen in your and my lifetime, but eventually that's going to happen. See, that's fascinating because there's a gradual movement that, that's unstoppable. Well, in this case, the movement is not moving north, it's moving down, it's sinking. Uh, very slowly, perhaps then quickly as well, um, she is sinking, her entire house is sinking. She's not aware of it, but she's sinking down to eternal death. Her paths go down to the, 
the unrighteous departed, which is a place called Sheol, where it's a place of darkness and misery forever, and none who go her paths ever come back. Now, I'm gonna say this. I mean, this can also be said to a young woman who's also gaining maturity, that down the road, you're gonna meet some young men who are gonna say things to you that you've never heard any of the godly men say to you, and it's gonna delight your soul, and it will arouse in you a passion that you didn't know was there. But if you have wisdom, you're gonna understand one of the key facets of wisdom. See, wisdom knows that every decision that we make has consequences down the road. No decision is ever made, and the, the consequences of those decisions kind of, kind of stay right there. Now, they have a ripple effect that moves along. And this is what the father wants his son, or in that, in any case, could have been a daughter as well, to know that in terms of your own sexuality, if you go the pathways of what is found in the culture as a whole, in, you know, in the world, in, in, among the unrighteous, if you follow that pathway, in the end of the day, the pathway doesn't lead to pleasure and ongoing pleasure. It leads to a vacuum of meaning, and in the end, it leads to you know, your years ending in a sigh with nothing permanent or nothing satisfying. Instead, what happens is that you eventually go down to eternal death. So that's the second example. So if you learn wisdom, if you make a pattern of it, you're gonna watch when your friends try to lead you astray, and you're gonna watch also when you come in contact with somebody who wants to take your sexuality and reshape it. So here's the third illustration. It's found in verses 20, 21, and 22, and it's a wonderful way to end. So you will walk in the way of the good, keep your path, and keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright, watch this, the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Now, this is an eternal promise. Uh, but Jesus said something very similar to that. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. In the end of the day, this transitory world will come to nothing. Uh, the book of uh, Second Peter says it will be rolled up like a scroll and it will, it's all going to burn. But God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And, and here's the wonderful thing about wisdom. Those who learn the wisdom that comes from God will inherit the land. They will inherit the new earth. They will live forever on it. There is a world to come that's filled with meaning, that's filled with purpose, that's filled with glorifying God, that's filled with eternal joy. If you had the insight to realize that it stood before you, you'd want it like nothing else. But there are all sorts of individuals who can't see that far down the road. They can't get beyond the immediate. And because they can't get beyond the immediate, they make choices so that down the road, they have nothing waiting for them. The writer of Proverbs says, look, my son, don't let that be your end. I love you so much. And this is what God is saying to every single one of us. I love you so much. I don't want your years to end with a sigh so that you spend eternity in the land of darkness and gloom and sorrow and suffering. It's not what I want for you. Learn the thoughts of wisdom so that the decisions that you make now have the best possible consequences. See, that's one sentence in the book of Proverbs. And again, let me start from the beginning if you receive my words, yeah. If you call out for insight, if you seek for it, if you treasure it and think that the wisdom that comes from God is the highest treasure that you can hold, that's your final destiny. It will lead you to avoid the mistakes that bring people to ruin, and it will allow you to inherit the land in the end of the day. That's the promise that's being made from God to all of us. A book of Proverbs is saying, that's what this book is promising. Understand that there is a wisdom that comes from God. God wants to give it to us. Let's treasure it, shall we? Let's continue to study the book of Proverbs, mine its treasures. Let's meditate on them. Let's apply them to our own lives. Let's learn the fear of the Lord. Let's understand that from his hand, flows all wisdom. Let's desire him above all other things. And I want to end this way. 
You know, if, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you know, if you've never been reconciled to God, if you've never understood that God makes you an offer of peace, that you can have your sins forgiven and been given the gift of eternal life, would you understand that God is offering you that? Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you, by faith in him, might have newness of life. What you need to do is start this way. Heavenly Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm estranged from you. And I confess that I've been going my own way. And I agree with you, God, this is sin. I know, however, that Christ died for my sins. And I'd like to receive his free gift of eternal life. Today, I want to turn from self and turn to you. Heavenly Father, grant me the gift of eternal life, and I will commit myself to Jesus all the days of my life. You pray that way and see what God does for you. Thanks for watching Back to the Bible Canada. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.